You're listening to Who Were the Comedian Harmonists, the true story behind Broadway's harmony. I'm your host, Ruthie Fierberg. The documentary opens with Harry's wife, Marion, with her listening it's silent. Uh, uh, there's nobody speaking. It opens with a shot of her listening to a record of the comedian harmonist, mm -hmm. and she begins to sob. It's funny. The documentary is rather dry, but that was, I thought, a beautiful way to open it because it spoke volumes as to what this little chapter in history was and what it meant to everyone. The wife of the founder of the group who created all of this. Uh, to, uh, all by way of saying, I am deeply moved whenever I hear them sing. By now, we know a lot about the six men of the comedian harmonists, and we've learned a bit about the women in their lives in past episodes. But each of these women lived great, dynamic lives. In fact, the women were a huge focus of Bruce Sussman's original draft for his book of the musical Harmony. At first had all those women in my first draft. Well, you needed a scorecard. I mean, it was just, it was just too many characters. The women were all there and I had fun writing it, but the guys paid a price and mm -hmm. I had to, I had to pull back. So I decided to focus on the two interfaith marriages. The final version of Harmony, which opened on Broadway on November 13th, 2023, included depictions of only two of the romantic partners of two singers in the comedian harmonists. Mary, the wife of Roman Sikowski, and Ruth, a fictional character who becomes the wife of Chopin, a.k.a. Erwin Boats. Ruth is partially a composite of women in Erwin's life and partially imagined. In real life, every single one of the comedian harmonists was married at least once. Today, we dig deeper into the individual stories of the women behind the men. We begin as the Eberhard Feschner documentary did. Marie, Erna, Elise, Lynn, Eckstein, and later, of course, Frommelmann. Our podcast historian, Jan Grubler, tells us the full name of Harry Frommelmann's first wife. The woman who appears under her American and new married name, Marion Kiss, in the documentary. She was from Hanover, born in uh, June 1905. So she was... Uh, of the same age, you can say, as Harry. And she was an actress, you can say a small stage actress. Erna was born on June 20th, 1905. She met Harry Fromerman at a party in 1929. She describes that later on, she bumped into Harry on the street and they went to a cafe together. Harry wasn't smoking, and she asked him about it because she remembered that he smoked last time. He said he quit, but she pressed him and learned that he had quit because he could not afford cigarettes. Erna decided to lend him money. She said in the documentary, he gave everything back to me later on, and from that moment on, we were really good friends. And more than that. Indeed, her profession as an actress led her to perform on the same stage as the comedian harmonists early in their career. Erna and the group, separately, were part of a review called how Can I Become Rich and Happy? Roughly translated. They performed in Leipzig, Germany in September of 1930. Her name is listed as Erna Eggstein Fromerman in the program, though she and Harry were not yet married. The couple actually wed on May 15th, 1931 in a civil ceremony. She was Protestant, and though Harry was Jewish, Erna told Feschner she didn't think about it at the time. When I say now that my husband is Jewish, I was not really thinking about it then. I only realized it later, well, when the Nazis came. The group called Erna by her nickname, Mossy, and multiple members noted in the Feschner film that Mossy was a bit domineering. And once the comedian harmonists garnered success, she spent money very quickly. But that domineering nature did help Harry at times. When murmurs of a plot to oust Harry from the group circulated, Erna was the one who pushed Harry to make himself invaluable to the group. She gave him the room to write and arrange day and night. By this time, she had given up her acting career. And as the comedian harmonists began to travel for concerts, Erna accompanied them. In 1934, 
Though the race laws had already come down, the comedian harmonists were still allowed to perform. They were the last group with Jewish members and associations to still be allowed to play in Germany. But by 1935, it was too unsafe. Erna fled to Vienna with Harry, as well as Roman and his wife, and Eric and his wife and daughter. In the Feschner film, Erna recalls that Baberti's mother questioned her decision to leave with Harry, but she simply replied, I would be leaving my parents here and going off into an uncertain future without knowing what would happen. But I said, I'm married to Harry. I've shared good times with him and I can't do otherwise. Arthur Fleischer, a well-known baritone in Austria's opera world, set Harry and Erna up in Vienna. The two moved in with Fleischer's ex-wife, coincidentally also named Erna. As we know, Harry, Roman Sikowski, and Eric Colleen formed a new group in Austria called the Comedy Harmonists. They recruited singers Ernst Engel, Johann Reichsess, and Rudolf Mayreder. Once the new ensemble had rehearsed, they began to tour, and Erna came along once again. In 1935, she traveled with him uh, during the concert tours. She went with him to Vienna then in uh, 1935, and also to Australia and South America and all that. Around this time, Harry, as well as Eric, lost their German citizenship. Roman never had it. As Jan noted in our episode dedicated to Roman, he was stateless. Erna was told she could return to Germany if she divorced Harry, but she declined. The group and their spouses all received special passports that allowed them to travel and continue touring. Erna and the other wives made celebrity appearances. There's a photograph in the Fremantle newspaper of one such appearance, but their special passports became invalid in the spring of 1938. After the last concert of the Comedy Harmonists in 1940, Erna and Harry moved to New York, where Harry and Eric tried to begin an American group. They didn't have much money, but Erna spent like the old days. Soon enough, Harry was drafted into the U.S. Army. She lived in New York, and uh, already during the war, when Harry went to the U.S. Army, then she made an uh, education as a a hairdresser in a beauty saloon. By 1943, Erna had found a job as a hairdresser. When World War II ended, Erna changed her name to Marion. She and Harry had also changed their last name from Fromerman to Froman. Marion Froman did not know the fate of her family back in Germany until a letter arrived saying her parents were alive. As she told Feschner, it was one of the happiest days in my life when I heard that they were both still alive, that the house was still standing, damaged, but standing. Meanwhile, Harry returned home from the war, only to go back to Germany as a translator in the Nuremberg trials, leaving Marion behind in New York again. Marion said she would have gone back to Germany to be with Harry, but he was always making an excuse. Then she said she found out Harry was living with someone else overseas. Harry returned to the States in 1952. That was the year Marion and Harry divorced. She remarried not long after. Her second husband was the owner of the beauty shop where she got her first hairdressing job. Her newly married name was Marion Kiss. Her second husband passed away in 1961, and Marion ran a women's hair salon in the Mayflower Hotel near Central Park until 1974. She passed away in New York in August of 1992 at the age of 87. In 1956, Harry wed for a second time to a woman named Olga Bertha Wolf. She was born in 1925, which made her 19 years younger than Harry. They met at a New Year's Eve party, as Harry describes in one of his written letters to his cousin, Joe. March 24th, 1956. My dear Joe, Exactly four weeks ago, I got married to the lady I only met in person on New Year's Eve. We were supposed to have met already earlier last year, but it never worked out. We are both from Berlin, have many things in common, also views in general, ethics, etc., and are happy, both, to have found another. The fact that she is not a Jewess has no bearing whatever as far as I'm concerned. Perhaps to you and the rest of the family... An irreconcilable thought, but you must not forget I was married before with a Gentile woman, 
So I'm used not to getting married to a Jewess. She is God-fearing, but not religious. Neither am I. And that's that. Olga was married to Harry for only four years. They divorced in 1960. As we heard in the episode dedicated to Harry, she couldn't abide by his mess of recording equipment and his need to listen to music at loud volumes. Without Harry being able to pursue his passion and with their incompatibility, the marriage soured. So Harry returned to Germany and reunited with a woman who had become his pen pal, Erika von Speth. They had met in approximately 1948, when Harry was in Europe after the war. According to her own account, Erica missed her train connection in Hanover, Germany, and was trying to get home to Bremen. So she went to the road to hitchhike, and a BMW with an American license plate pulled over. As Erica recalled, he had already gotten out of his car and introduced himself in English. I had known the comedian harmonists since my early youth and loved them dearly. But Harry called himself Froman now, and the name did not ring a bell to me. Nonetheless, she accepted the ride. Erica was married at the time, but her husband was missing in action. Erica and Harry kept a friendship, writing letters throughout the 1950s. On August 2nd, 1962, at Erica's urging, Harry returned to Germany. Harry was entitled to reparations from the German government. At first, he lived across the street from Erica. In 1968, Erica's father died, and Harry moved into the house, living on the second floor where she made an apartment for him. Mark Alexander, the grandson of comedian harmonist Eric Colleen, actually met Erica. I met Erica in what must have been the late 1970s, but we met her when she came to Los Angeles and she and my grandmother knew one another. Erica stayed in Santa Monica at the Miramar Hotel, and my impression of her was that she was this kind of stately, friendly business lady. She presented herself as a very together, you know, kind of stately, composed person, and my sense was that She wanted to be there and she wanted to meet with my grandmother and my grandmother met with her. I'm sure that they had a few meals together. Again, it's interesting that, you know, after all of these years, these people were connecting again. What's also interesting is that I don't think Erica met Harry Fromerman until after World War II. That's right. So I'm not certain about how she and my grandmother would have met in the first place, but the connection had to be through the comedian harmonists or the comedy harmonists. We know that Harry and Eric kept in touch after the disbanding of multiple versions of their singing group. So perhaps the couples talked about each other as old friends do. While Harry never had any children with Marion, nor Olga, nor Erica, Erica had a son of her own, named Eric von Speth. In interviews, Eric refers to Harry as his father. He referred to him as a caring man. Erica had some health problems, and Harry often tended to her. In October 1975, the couple spent two weeks at a health spa. On October 29th, 1975, the intercom in the house rang. Erica explained, We had installed an intercom system in the house during the time that I had been very sick. And suddenly there was a call. Please come upstairs real quick. I had already fallen asleep and did not know what time it was. I went upstairs. He sat in his chair in his pajamas and just repeated, no air, no air. Harry passed away that night. Erica continued to live her life in Bremen until she passed away in 1998. Similar to Harry Fromerman, there were three significant women in Eric Colleen's life. His wife, Fernand, 
his daughter, Suzanne, and his younger sister, Anne-Marie. Eric did have an older sister, Charlotte, but we know a little bit less about her, and it seems she and Eric were not as close. Eberhard Feschner, and he came to California in 1976 or 75 and interviewed my grandmother, my mother, and my grandfather, Eric's sister, Anna Marie, who came from uh, Australia and participated in the documentary. Eric's grandson, Mark, and Mark's sister, Deborah, hold much of the family history, including greater details about their grandmother, Eric's wife, Fernand. Fernand was born September 11th, 1909 in Paris. Eric met Fernand in 1930. She was the daughter of a German tailor and a French homemaker. In case you need a refresher, Deborah reminds us of how they met. That is a story that came to me through Nana, and I, I call my grandmother Nana, um, so I, that will kind of come out every once in a while. Give it to us. We um, want the real. We want the authentic. <laughs> and I got it in a couple of different versions, so I'll give you what I think is a kind of a reasonable amalgam of all of those, and that is that she had gone to a nightclub, and she was very careful to say it was classy, it was dignified nightclub. <laughs> And she met Eric and they danced um, and he invited her to see him in concert like the following night or sometime that week. So she arranged to have a friend take her to the performance. Um, And apparently her friend was completely unimpressed with the comedian harmonist and wanted to leave early. Ah, no taste. (laughs) And so he took her home. She said goodbye to him. He left. She turned right around, she got in a cab, she went back to the performance, and that's when they really met. And I guess may, maybe afterwards they went to a nightclub, and then they exchanged contact information. So he, of course, was on tour, so he left town. Right. And he wrote her a letter. And the letter was addressed to Fernandi Holtzauer, which was not her last name. Her last name was Holtzheimer. And she was deeply offended that he had gotten the name wrong. So much for being the head of correspondence. (laughs) I guess he learned his lesson (laughs) later on. And so she didn't write him back. She said, well, you know, uh, performers, they have a reputation. Mm. And so uh, he wrote her a couple other letters. And at that point, he got the name right. I think he realized he'd made a mistake. And then when he came back around to Frankfurt, which is where she was living, they met up again. And they were married shortly after that. They married on June 30th, 1931 in Frankfurt, where Fernand was living with her family. She was living with her family and she was apprenticed to a dressmaker and she was very interested in like fashion design. And that's what she was doing. And her, I think her sister, her sister was, was a hat maker. Oh, wow. And her parents were tailors. So it was really very, the family was all involved in, um, in clothing. As we know from our episode dedicated to Eric, Fernand traveled with the comedian harmonists as they rose to fame. They welcomed a daughter, Suzanne, on March 31st, 1932. Suzanne is Mark and Deborah's mother. With a baby in tow, Fernand continued to travel with her husband and the group. But soon she decided to stay in Berlin to give some stability to Suzanne. Of course, that all changed when Eric was declared a Jew and a non-Aryan according to the German race laws despite the fact that he did not consider himself Jewish and had been baptized, just as Anne-Marie said in the documentary. The race laws were put into place in Germany in 1933. A story we have is that there was a parade of German soldiers, and my mother was with Roman Sikowski, Now, my mother was born in 1932, so she would have been a very little girl. Roman was one of the members of the Comedian Harmonists, and she remembered him growing up. And he he put her on his shoulders so she could watch the parade go by. And then she started singing a Purim song, which we assume she must have learned because by then Jewish children were being put in Jewish day schools. They were being segregated from the public school system. And Roman was horrified and frightened and (laughs) stuck her under his overcoat and got out of there very quickly. 
1935, the comedian harmonists disbanded. Fernand and Suzanne fled with Eric and the other Jewish members and their wives to Vienna. And as we know, Eric, Harry, and Roman established the comedy harmonists. Fernand and Suzanne began accompanying the new group on tour again. At the end of the 30s, the reconstituted group, the comedy harmonists, visited Australia. And we have photographs of my grandmother in an Australian newspaper after being interviewed. In fact, it was that article that Deborah believes affected her grandmother's interview in the Feshner documentary. Well, she had felt very reserved and kind of constrained during those interviews. And the, I think the major reason was because her second, she had, by that time she had remarried and her second husband was very interested in all of this interviewing business. And he was there every day watching. And she said that she didn't feel comfortable talking about the glamorous life she had with her first husband in front of her second husband. So she didn't feel free to talk about him. And her other her other hesitation was that she had had a rather difficult interchange with a journalist in Australia that made her very uncomfortable, where she had told them that um, she made her own clothes, which she was very proud of. Yeah, she had been apprenticing in fashion. Of course she was proud. Exactly, exactly. These are skills she was very proud of, and she didn't like their coffee. And I don't think anybody really cared about the coffee comment, but when it get, got back to the guys that she said she made her own clothes, they were very upset because they thought it was de classe to make your own clothes. But she, on the other hand, who had been trained, you know, as a dressmaker, was very proud of these skills. And so she, she was not very trusting of, of journalists after that. Suzanne, Eric and Fernand's daughter, remembered touring very fondly. In her words, my earliest memories are of touring with my parents and of failing to learn to whistle from my father, though for some reason he tried very hard to teach me. For the first few years of my life, I was surrounded by performing artists. I assumed anyone worth knowing was an artist of some kind. I liked the excitement of touring, the constant change, the performances. To this day, I feel most at home in a nice old hotel. Suzanne inherited a bit of her father's performing gene as well. She loved to dance and would eagerly perform for anyone who asked. By 1937, Fernand and Suzanne stopped touring with Eric as Suzanne needed to go to school. So the mother-daughter pair settled in France. They ended up back in Paris and essentially living at a pension that was run by a friend of theirs and just kind of keeping keeping a low profile and you know what it was like to be in occupied France. I remember my mother saying once that she was in the habit of going to to swim in the Seine, you know, because they were living in Paris and one day there was an air raid and she had nowhere to go and she was like running through the streets trying to find somebody to open a door and finally somebody opened a door and she got in there and she was able to take shelter. I also, I mean, a very notable story, and I think it really tells a lot about just like how some people accidentally survived. When my grandmother and my mother, just as the war was happening, they tried to escape with some friends in a car and go south, right? Because they were trying to get out of Paris. And, and they were on the roads and they were being strafed and they were ending up in ditches. And uh, eventually they got to some small town. I think I may have the name of it somewhere in the album. Um, and the Germans were there and they turned people back. So they had to go back to Paris. And everybody who ended up back there had to register at the town hall. So Nana took all of her papers and she went to the town hall and she gave them up to the officer. Of course, it was must have been a, a Nazi officer. And he looked at the papers and he saw that the married name was Abraham, mm. right? Because Eric's actual birth name is Abraham. And so he looks at my grandmother and he looks at the papers and he says, I want you to go home and burn every piece of paper you have that ties you to this man. And I never want to see you here again. And so she went home, burned everything, which is one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of documentation from that period. She had my mother baptized. She had her, she put her in a Catholic school. She stopped speaking German to her and she did not talk about Eric and so that is pretty much what what kind of got them through the wars. They kept a very low profile. When the decree first came down that they weren't going to be able to sing in Germany, 
that was the thing that made them leave more so than a threat on their lives was a threat to their livelihoods for the Jewish members. And they left and it ended up saving their lives. But I have to imagine yeah. that having those close calls so close to you, right, with your mother, that that has to affect you and has to have affected the way you related to your mother, who in this story of the comedian Harmonist, it's very funny that the name Suzanne is just the daughter of a comedian Harmonist. But talking to you, right, it's the entirely different flipped relationship of she's the matriarch. She's the main character for a lot of your life story rather than the the small offshoot of a vocal group. So that Mm -hmm. perspective in and Mm -hmm. of itself is is absolutely fascinating to hear how her childhood was right. Not just what her father's life was like touring around, but that her childhood was deeply affected not only by the war, but by what her father did. One of the things that just reminds me of something that mom told me, and it, it made me realize that her experience, like they, my mother and my grandmother were very close, but uh, their stories would diverge at some points. And at a certain point in the war, because things just got too messy, mom was farmed out quite literally, to a farm in the, you know, outside of Paris. Oh, wow. And so she lived with his family for a certain amount of time and then rejoined her mom. I don't know how long this took because I didn't get a lot of details. Mm -hmm. But she told me that later on, after the war was over, but they were still in France, she went to visit the family. And at that point, she knew she was Jewish. So she told the mother her big secret. And the mother said, that's okay, dear, but let's not tell Papa. Hmm. And that stuck in my mom's head. Um, and I think everything was fine and they you know, visited. But years later, a movie was made called The Two of Us about an old guy, uh, you know, in a rural setting and a kid, you know, turns up is basically farmed out and the kid's Jewish. He knows he's Jewish, but the old guy doesn't know. And so the kid has to has to has to keep, keep his secret from the man. Mm-hmm. Quite specifically, he can't get naked in front of this man, mm. right? Because he's circumcised. So it's a beautiful movie, beautifully done. And my mom saw this movie and she said, and that's when the story came out because that had been her experience. Fernand and Suzanne were in France and separated from Eric until 1947. Finally, in 1947, when Eric had settled in California, Fernand and Suzanne reunited with him. By then, Suzanne was 14 years old and didn't even know her father was alive. When my mother was 14 years old and the war was over and she hadn't seen her father since she was a little girl and didn't really have a memory of him. Decades later, Mark would get to know his grandparents well. Deborah would know her grandmother, Fernand, but Eric passed away when Deborah was still quite young. According to their own passed down history, Fernand worked in the U.S. at Bullock's Wilshire and Bullock's Westwood, two different locations of a department store. Mark recalls her working in the hat department. Deborah remembers robes. Mark says she was also an assistant buyer for the store. After Eric's early death in 1961, Fernand eventually remarried. She wed Bruce Curie on January 21st, 1964. Mark and Deborah also shared more memories of their mother, Suzanne. Our mother was very good with languages, too. Oh so German was her first language. Um, but then it, they abruptly stopped speaking German to her during the war. And she had some really negative associations. Of course. So it, she just didn't. She was not warm towards German. And so she said, this is a kind of a, a moving comment. She said, whenever I hear German. I don't understand, but I feel like I should, and it makes me want to cry. So she had very intense feelings about it. But of course, her French was fluent, her Spanish was fluent, and she did a very short job working as a secretary for Sam Peckinpah in Yugoslavia. She was only there for like two months, and she started picking up the language there. She like came back speaking some Serbo-Croatian, which blew my mind completely. But it it was just uh, an indication that she picked up languages very easily. That was also helpful when Suzanne and Fernand immigrated to the United States. 
As Eric found employment in the U.S., he and Fernand and Suzanne made themselves a new life. Fernand received some money from the German government. Eric worked, and Suzanne went to school. First, she attended Fairfax High, then Hollywood High, before graduating and later studying at UCLA. Suzanne married Al Alexander on December 21st, 1950. Together, they had a son, Mark. They divorced, and Suzanne remarried a man named Lester Martin Tint on April 4th, 1956. Suzanne and Lester had a daughter, Deborah. Suzanne and Lester later separated, and in 1961, Suzanne paired up with Rudolf Francis Croswell, better known as Rudy. Throughout her life, Suzanne was a political activist, joining civil rights organizations and marching in Los Angeles. Mark remembers attending a rally for freedom with her at Wrigley Field in 1963. In 1968, Suzanne moves with her husband Rudy and daughter Deborah to New York. There, she protested the Vietnam War and was even arrested and jailed at one point. In 1972, her marriage to Rudy ended and Suzanne returned to California. She went back to school for her master's in fine arts at Cal State. Through the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, Suzanne worked as a legal secretary for labor attorneys, civil rights lawyers, and more. In the 1980s, while on a hike in Griffith Park, Suzanne met Don Trask, who she married on July 30th, 1992. Suzanne passed away on December 17th, 1994. In his eulogy for his mother, Mark said, she loved to talk, to argue, to read, to paint, to swim, to dance, to walk, to march. She loved to eat and drink. She was always dieting. And I'm sure if she were here to comment, she would be thoroughly pissed that she had died. Mark and Deborah continue her legacy in more ways than one. Professionally speaking, Mark is an attorney living in California. Those rallies and activism seeped in. Deborah is an artist who has painted murals, theater sets, store displays, and more. That love of art remains a family thread. Ten years ago, Deborah became a librarian. She lives in New York City and works for the Brooklyn Public Library as a special collections cataloger. Mark and Deborah not only reminisced about their grandparents and mother, they also remembered their aunt Anne Marie, Eric's sister. What, to your knowledge, was your grandfather, Eric, and his sister, Anne-Marie's relationship? Well, they were quite uh, close, I think, emotionally. Eric was born in 1899, and I think Anne-Marie was born in 1903, so she was the younger sister. He also had an older sister who had uh, married a physician and moved to Switzerland. And Anne-Marie told me that one of her earliest memories was... When she was about five years old, she was at a birthday party, and she met uh, an ancient relative with a huge mustache. We think that that would have been Daniel Collin, Eric's mother's father. And she said that they were made to stand back to back. And she was, and, and they said, oh, you look so much like him. And he was an old man with a huge mustache. And she thought, I don't like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't think anyone would, let alone a five-year-old. And she was, she was, she thought of herself, I, I think, as the ugly duckling in the family. But she had a very warm personality and she connected very well with the documentarian Eberhard Feschner. And uh, she uh, was teaching music in Berlin in the early 1930s. And because of the race laws, she ended up teaching in an all uh, Jewish school. Right. Because she wouldn't have been allowed to teach amongst yes. the, the German population as they saw it. And she had a uh, partner named who we knew as Lancy, Lancy Lansberg, and they were really close friends. And when the war came, they split up and Lancy ended up moving to England and uh, Anne-Marie ended up moving to Australia. And I think they didn't see each other till decades later after the war. Had you met Anne-Marie? I did. I did. The first time I met her was in 1960, shortly before my grandfather's 
death in 1961, and Anne-Marie came to the United States and celebrated Christmas with Eric and his family. Eric, for that occasion, got a flocked Christmas tree, and Anne-Marie uh, remarked, and maybe this was in the Eberhard uh, Fashioner documentary, that she was very touched by that because she thought that by getting a flocked Christmas tree, Eric was trying to reproduce their childhood in Berlin. So the, the next time I saw her was in 1976, and or actually a little, maybe it was a little earlier, and she came to participate in Eberhard Feschner's documentaries, Ex Leben, and she was interviewed by him. And he, as I said, he connected very well with her. Who He described her as this warm person who was very willing and able to speak about the past in Germany. And he came away with a very warm feeling that he had a good connection with this person and this had been a good interview. And I, th I think the, the last thing I remember about her is that she was living in Sydney and she must have been living in a retirement home or a large apartment building. And she kept the library there and she enjoyed book binding. She liked to bind books. And I think that this may have, again, been a family connection because uh, Daniel Collin, who was Eric Collin's mother's father, had been in the publishing business. When the comedian Harmonist went on tour and Nana went, there were a few times when Nana went with them and a mom stayed with, for, uh, with Anna Marie. And oh. we have this lovely photograph where they're they're on her um they she lived in berlin and they're on like an outdoor uh patio and they have their foreheads touching and it's the the caption on the back of the photograph is the bad stepmother and it's just a very very sweet photograph and this is like when mom was five years old yeah mom and dad were away auntie Anne marie took the reins yeah and she really adored mom and i think regretted not having the opportunity to have children. She really loved mm. the experience of mothering. Anne-Marie passed away in 1979 in Sydney, Australia. The legacy of Eric and Fernand Colleen lives on in Deborah, as well as Mark and his children and grandchildren. Just as Eric Colleen was married to one woman in his life, so too was Roman Sikowski. Roman fell in love with Mary Magdalena Panzram, who was born in 1907 in Dortmund, Germany. She is the only woman who is represented in the musical Harmony based on her actual story. Actor Sierra Bogus played the role of Mary in the Broadway production. What research, if any, did you do about the real Roman and... Mary. Yeah. I think because she was a woman, there's not a lot about her. And there just wasn't because obviously she never, she wasn't famous for, she she was married to Josef Roman Sikowski. And what I love is they've obviously, Bruce Sussman, who wrote this, has taken liberty of writing what he thinks it could have been like for them and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But like real life facts is like that Roman actually bought her a candy shop. It's true. Roman bought her a candy shop. But let's rewind before we get there. Mary and Roman met in May 1929 in Cologne at a party thrown by Roman's ex-girlfriend's family. Mary eventually moved to Berlin and began studying fashion. And in 1931, Roman bought her a candy store. In Harmony, Mary is no store owner. Instead, Bruce Sussman picked up on that detail about her studying fashion. I like how she's written in our show, too, that, that she is a seamstress and that she literally is making coats for people or then in the second act tearing them apart to hide money in them to get people out safe. What's the backstory that the two of you, if there is a backstory, that the two of you have created so that you can walk into the midpoint yeah. of a relationship? Great. So in the script, I say... 
I decided that we should meet and made sure we did. So now we know that Mary's the kind that's like, I want that and I'm going to make this happen. Yes, I love and it. And so, <laughs> and I say, every Tuesday, the group, which is them starting out, they have just started out, you guys performed outside of my shop window. And every Tuesday, I would come out then and I would drop a button into his, into the thing instead of money, which is kind of funny. It's like they could actually do with some money, yeah. you know, but it's like, <laughs> but she put buttons. So that's that's the backstory. I drop buttons to get his attention because I'm I sew. That's what I do, and I look out this window every day, and, and I there they are, and there's these boys, and he's the one that I like, and so I put buttons, and and then I bring him a coat, and I actually steal him a coat because what I'm actually saying when I my very first line is a customer brought this into the shop a year ago to have the lining mended and never picked it up, so now it's yours. In the musical, Roman asks Mary for her hand in marriage and also asks her to convert to Judaism. That story is true to life. Roman proposed in 1933 and asked Mary to convert. Mary, being a non-Jew, which she was in real life too, and she converts to Judaism in order to be with the love of her life. And that touches me deeply. The first song that I sing is called, What Do You See?, and literally saying, I every day that I sit and sew at my window, I look out on a world that's tearing apart. Every day as I sit and sew at my window, I look out on a world that's tearing apart. This is what I see. And what do you see? In the show, Mary recognizes the rising danger in Germany. In real life, there isn't any indication that Mary knew more than anyone else. But she was also the only non-Jewish partner of a comedian harmonist who was considering converting, not only marrying a Jew. Mary agreed to this. She remembered her mother's saying, Your God is where you find him, a sentiment that deeply impacted writer Bruce Sussman. There was one sentence that said it all to me. Your God is where you find him. When she said that in the documentary, I said, I know who this woman is. She was thoughtful, open-minded, without prejudice. Think about it. Jews are being excoriated everywhere she turned, and it has no effect on her feelings for the man she loves or the decision she made. She's being told that Jews are vermin, and she converts to Judaism. Mary traveled with the comedian harmonists as their star continued to rise. In the show, Mary travels with the group to the United States. There's a scene that takes place backstage after the comedian harmonists have performed, and Mary pushes the group to consider staying in America. In actuality, we don't believe Mary was in the U.S. at the time, but that scene is indicative of a broader truth, that the women toured with the group that they would have been present for numerous conversations about travel and business. I think Mary's reason for being in this show, in my mind, is to hold space for all of these ways that people are trying to exist. And she is actually, they call it like in the, when they write like your character description, it's like she's the seer. Whether the real Mary saw what was coming or not, she was loyal to Roman. In 1935, she fled to Vienna with him and the other Jewish members and their wives. Roman and Mary were not officially wed by this point, at least not in the eyes of government. It is possible that they were married in a Jewish ceremony in Germany. Either as his fiance or his wife under God, Mary supported Roman through the founding of the new group, the Comedy Harmonists. When she was offered to return to Germany, she rejected the prospect. Mary received a special passport that allowed her to travel. The group went from Vienna to the Soviet Union to London and later to Belgium and Paris, all in 1936. In 1937, on the group's way to Australia, they stopped in London. This is where Roman and Mary were legally wed. In Australia, Mary participated in celebrity appearances with the comedy harmonists and their wives. In 1938, the group was touring in Italy when Mussolini enacted anti-Jewish laws. The men stayed in Italy to determine their next move and to try to get paid for the work they had done. 
they sent their wives back to Vienna ahead of them. The women arrived in Vienna on the night of March 12th, 1938, the very day Hitler invaded Austria. Mary was one of the women who fled to the Swiss border and then moved on to London. We believe that Mary accompanied Roman on the next legs of their tours to South America, London, Canada, the United States, another visit to Australia, and then an engagement in Hawaii. After concerts in Honolulu, they went to San Francisco. In the early 1940s, while in the United States, Roman received the news about the death of his father and decided to retire his life as a comedy harmonist to become a cantor. In the summer of 1941, Mary and Roman drove from New York to Los Angeles, where Roman received a job offer to be a cantor. The couple applied for immigrant status, which, after some difficulty due to Mary's German citizenship, was granted. They lived in Los Angeles for six years before moving to San Francisco. In 1971, they retired together in Palm Springs. The bit of actual footage that I've seen of her is when she was in her 80s, or she might have been in her 90s even, because he was, and they're six years apart. But when they lived, her and, and her husband lived out the rest of their lives in Palm Springs, which is where Barry met them. And, and the footage of them just sitting together and playing cards, because apparently they played gin together every night. And I'm just like, you know, after all that they went through of Growing up in Berlin in that time, she did, obviously, and and then the Nazis rise to power and all this that they have seen and been through and then escaped from, that they can, like, live the rest of their lives out in Palm Springs and play cards. I'm like, yes, you deserve that. Kind of, <laughs> like, you deserve that level of joy. And she's so joyful, and she was so—she's funny, and also she— you know, a woman in that time, it's like she knew her place, and she didn't seem to be too upset that she was just, she knew, because even the interviewer asks, like, which one of you wins? And she goes, oh, <laughs> and laughs. And he goes, she does. <laughs> and then they, that dynamic. Like, she knows, like, no, I, I don't know, you know? And then he, the interviewer asks, like, a joke. He's like, do you cheat? And she goes, no, I don't need to. She says, I think I'm very good. And I'm just like, I love her so much. The earnestness in yes, that. Yes, completely. Roman passed away in 1998. Mary lived another eight years. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in her old age. She passed away in January 2006 at the age of 98. Every single day we'll remember what we do today. Words we didn't say We'll remember every single day Then years go by To wonder why And wonder what we learned Was that the bridge we should've crossed That one we burned while there are certainly fewer details about most of these women than the men they were associated with, there is even less known about Hilda Longino, the woman who became Robert Baberti's wife after a 10-year relationship. She was born June 13, 1907, in Halberstadt. We know she was an actor as she met Robert at the Ufa Studios. Robert and Hilda began living together in 1934. It's said she traveled with him often. Aside from this, we know very little. Hilda passed away in 1968. We know a little bit more about the women tied to Ari Leshnikov. In the episode devoted to his story, we talked about his first and second wives. But before Ari was first married, there was another woman. During Ari's time at the Hawk School for Music, he met a woman named Ella from Danzig, Germany. We don't know her last name, but she was a piano student. Ari and Ella wanted to be married, but Ella's parents wouldn't allow their German daughter to marry a foreigner, as Ari was from Bulgaria. After Ella, Ari's next serious relationship was with Delphina David. Records indicate she was born in 1906. She was a dancer with a group called the Tiller Girls. Ari and Delphine bumped into each other at the British embassy as Delphine was British. Her father was French, but her mother was Irish. 
Records indicate that they met in 1929 and actually had a son in 1930, who they named Ari Leshnikov. But the baby died only a day old. Ari and Delphine stayed together and eventually married in Berlin in 1932. Their son, Simeon, was born in May 1938. By 1939, Ari and his family had returned to Bulgaria. Ari was called up to the Bulgarian army, and Delphine stayed home to raise Simeon. They lived on the second floor of an apartment building that Ari had bought, and they rented out the other units. But on January 10th, 1944, bombs fell in their neighborhood. Delphine and Simeon survived, but they had no home. The Friedman biography reports that they moved in with an English woman who was married to a Bulgarian. National ties run deep. When Ari finished his service, he tried to find work as a singer, and Delphine began teaching English lessons. In 1947, Delphine's father passed away. She and Simeon traveled to England to see her family and never returned, though there was not much home to return to. Eventually, the government annulled Delphine and Ari's marriage. Delphine lived out her days in England. Simeon passed away in 1994. He is survived to this day by two daughters, Jessica and Nancy. Delphine died in 1999. After Delphine and Simeon moved to England, Ari met and married a woman named Sashka Andrejevka Sidorova. According to one archive, Sashka was born in 1928. They met through a setup around the time of Ari's 48th birthday. They married in 1952, when Ari was 55, and Sashka, if truly born in 1928, would have been 24. She was a kindergarten teacher. In 1958, they welcomed a son who they named Henri. Sashka continued to work as a kindergarten teacher, and she passed away in 2003. Finally, are the three wives of Erwin Boats. Ursula Elkin was his first. She grew up in Germany. She was born in an area not too far from Frankfurt. So for the most part, she grew up in Alsbach. Her father built a house for the family, and she was born nearby and lived in Alsbach as a small child. There's a photograph of her with her parents and her younger brother standing on the front steps of the house in Alsbach. And I visited it last year in May. I was doing a, some work on a project for my grandfather, and they brought me to the house that he built and that she grew up in. And I have a photograph of me standing on the very same steps that she stood on as a child. Wow. What did that feel like to be able to plant your feet on ground where your family comes from? Yeah, I'm getting emotional just talking about it, thinking about it, remembering it. I took three pebbles from the grounds at the house and I brought them with me. I brought two to London because I was going to London after my trip to Germany. And I visited my grandparents' gravesite for the first time. And in Jewish tradition, you leave a pebble on the headstone. So I left two pebbles. And I kept one and I have it here. It's a, it's a very lovely house. It would be considered very luxurious, even by today's standards, if this were in the United States. And it's several stories and it's got beautiful grounds. And once upon a time, the gardens must have been magnificent. Um, there was a little cobblestone area in the back where there might have been a tea table or such set up for garden lunches. There was a picket fence around the bigger part of the property on top of a stone wall. And it it was just very touching for me to be there. It was high up on the hill, so it had quite a vantage point to look at the, the community, the vicinity, the area around the house. Remind us when your mother was born. She was born in 1910. And her father was an artist, is that right? He was a very well-known artist in Germany. What's his name? His name was Benno Elken. And he was a very well-known artist who did commissions. He did work for organizations, public sculptures, private commemorative medallions. He did a lot of medallions. He did busts, etc. And he's most well-known for the menorah of Israel in Jerusalem at the Knesset. Was your grandfather's studio at the house? I would assume so because it was a big enough house to have a studio there. 
So it's possible that your mother grew up kind of surrounded by not only an artist, but his art and the and the process of his art. Absolutely. My grandfather, to the best of our understanding, was friends with a lot of his contemporary artists in Germany. He was greatly involved with various artist associations. He was a, a very well-connected artist. He knew how to do the business of being connected and mm. getting to know the money people and the museum people and the art people. And he was head of one of these art organizations. He became one of the decadent artists, a group of artists from Germany who have this title of a group because they were recipients of letters from the Nazis saying your work is decadent and you can no longer work in Germany. Oh, the degenerate art, you mean? Degenerate, decadent. Yeah, there are different words for it. Yeah. Yeah, the degenerate artists. Thank you. And he saw that. And because he was politically savvy and could see the tea leaves, he and his wife left Germany in 34. They received the letter in 33. So they left early enough that they could take possessions with them. And they moved to London. And and so your grandfather was an artist. What is your grandmother's name? And did she work or was she head of house? Well, yes and no. My grandmother was Hedwig Einstein. Her brother was Carl Einstein, who was a very well-known art historian and writer and collector. It is understood through his writings that he had visited Africa and brought African art back to Europe, to France in particular. And Cubism, that art movement, is a direct result of his bringing African art back into Europe. Oh, my goodness. What a legacy. Yeah. Hedwig Einstein, my grandmother, was a concert pianist. So she was very well accomplished in her own right. She traveled all over Europe as a pianist. And the story goes that when Benno and she married, Benno said there will be only one artist in the family and you're not it. Wow. What a sacrifice to make. Yes. And did they have other children besides your mother, Ursula? My mother had a younger brother, Wolf, Wolf Elkin, who studied medicine at Heidelberg. And again, as the Nazis came into power, he left. He went to Italy to study medicine, and then Italy started having its political problems, and he came to New York City and continued studying medicine and became quite a prominent surgeon in New York City. Wow. And was he younger or older than her? Two plus years younger than my mother. Ursula and Erwin married in May of 1932, but it was a short-lived marriage. They both say the marriage didn't work out because of their lack of long-term compatibility. Other members of the group say otherwise. Ursula fled Germany in the early 1930s and wound up in France. She and Erwin officially divorced in 1937. The way I understand the story is that she was working in Paris. She had a lot of friends. She was going to school. She went to the Sorbonne. And one night, somebody came to her door, knocking on the door very intensely and saying, Here's a ticket to a train that's leaving tomorrow. Here's a ticket to a boat that's leaving Lavra tomorrow. Be on them. And again, that scene from Casablanca where Rick is at the train station waiting for Elsa, the chaos of the train station, the franticness, the desperation for people to get out. It was literally the day before the Nazis walked into Paris. That's unbelievable. I found out recently, only within the last year, that she had had a visa to the United States that had been in her back pocket for six months. So she was she was ready. ready. It was just a question of when and how. She came to New York. She had a sponsor there, uh, some very well-known people who were also friends of her parents. And she was sponsored by them because you needed sponsors in those days. And so she came and she stayed in their apartment And the story that I have from this woman who was my godmother, she, Ursula, would put her shoes out in the hallway at night, expecting them to be polished and returned the next morning in an apartment building in New York City. Yeah, they left New York in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. I have to give my mother a lot of credit because 
My father was a writer. He wrote for television in the early days of television in the 1950s. And remind us what your father's name is. My father's name is Joel Hamill. And he wrote for things like Studio One, Playhouse 90, The Defenders, the really early days of good television when the writing was good and original and dramatic. And he wrote for television. And like wow. all writers, they have their dry spells and they struggle. And Ursula was very creative. I attribute some of my creativity directly from her. Some of my other creativity comes directly from my father. She liked to crochet and she made things. And as the story goes, in the early 1950s, she made a hat and somebody admired the hat and said, could you do this for a department store? Could you make a business of this? And one thing led to another, and they had a very successful millinery business through the 1950s into the early 60s. Joel was working in the studios. Ursula worked in art galleries because she had this profound history of art and being near artists and collectors and so on. She had a style that was quietly elegant. She wasn't pretentious. She wasn't flashy. She was just very quietly elegant. We did not have a close relationship. She was raised probably, I'm assuming, with household help that took care of the children. As a result, I was raised the same way. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have that mother-daughter relationship that so many people are fortunate to have. She was pretty much a stranger to me. She was this person over there. I can remember sitting on her bed, watching her get dressed to go out for the evening with my father. Those mm -hmm. were tender moments for me, but as close as she let me get to her. Ursula isn't known to have had contact with Erwin once they separated. She lived a whole new life. She passed away in 2004. After Ursula and Erwin divorced in 1938, Erwin married Ruth Zemetsky. Ruth was born in 1910 and was also Jewish and also the daughter of a sculptor. Ruth's marriage to Erwin was also her second. She was divorced and had a daughter. When Ruth and Erwin married on August 16th, 1940, Erwin became a stepfather. The two later welcomed a son named Michael in 1944. But Ruth and Erwin divorced in 1945. Not much more is known about Ruth. She died in 1996. Later on, Erwin met and married his third wife, Helga Gade. Better known as Heli, she was born April 28, 1933. When Heli and Erwin met, she was an art student at the Hamburg Art School. The two began a courtship. In 1959, Erwin emigrated to Canada, where his sister lived. He promised Heli that once he was settled, he would send for her. And he did. They were married on July 23, 1961. In the Feshner documentary, Heli describes their wedding day. We had decided to get married when we were in Canada. It was a house wedding, so to speak, on a very small scale. We were sitting in the living room playing cards when suddenly Erwin jumped up and said, my God, we're getting married and left the house. I thought, he's not coming back. He's scared. Five minutes before the ceremony, he came running back with a bunch of roses. Come quickly, the pastor's waiting. Then we drove to the church. Ten minutes later, it was all over. One account says that during the 1960s, Heli worked as a window dresser for a major fashion group. Heli and Erwin moved back to Germany in 1971. He died in 1982. We do not know about the end of Heli's life, except that she died in Hamburg on November 21st, 2015. In Harmony, the character of Erwin Boats is the only comedian harmonist besides Roman who has a romantic partner. And as we've mentioned, the character's name is Ruth, and she's a composite of people and ideas. It's a total coincidence that the character's name is the same as that of Erwin's second wife. Bruce didn't know about Ruth Semetsky. He just wanted a name for his character. Because it was a composite character, I said, I have to fictionalize her name. I'm literally sitting in my chair and saying, okay, so who, so a brave woman who uh, stands up to the Nazis, Ruth, my upstairs neighbor. So I took her name. Within minutes, that took me to the book of Ruth. Within minutes, that took me to where you go. Right. Because Ruth biblically is famously 
the the heroine who's when her husband dies, right. the mother-in-law says, go, you know, go back to right. your family. And she says, no, where you go, I will go. Right. So it was all there. Okay. So that's my, that's it. We go to La Jolla, we go to Atlanta. And then I find out that his second wife is named Ruth. Well, I had two choices, change her name, throw out the song, throw out the scene, throw out the biblical reference. No, I'm sorry. The truth of the play takes precedence over uh, anything else. Now, the fact is that, you know, someone could say, well, at least you, you took the name of the, of the second, second wife. I did not. That right. was absolute coincidence. Where you go, I will go in your dreams, in the shadows and cool. took a lot of inspiration from his upstairs neighbor, also named Ruth. She's a Holocaust survivor who met Adolf Eichmann, an official of the Nazi party and one of the foremost organizers of the Holocaust, when she was a little girl. This Ruth's mother was a seamstress, and to this day, Ruth regrets not grabbing her mother's scissors and stabbing Eichmann when she, quote, had the chance. That survivor's guilt heavily influenced Bruce's depiction of Roman in Harmony, but it also impacted actor Julie Banco's portrayal of the onstage Ruth. As I thought about Ruth, who is a Holocaust survivor, she's, I think, 92 or 93. Incredible. She's from Leopoldstadt, actually. What a place to be from and a connection that yeah. now, of course, our audience really knows that yes. as a buzzword. And she apparently lives with great survivor's guilt. For She has this story where she, uh, she met Adolf Eichmann when she mm -hmm. was... 10 years old, and she still lives with regret. Still, Julie drew from multiple sources when crafting the only principal in Harmony who wasn't a real person. Where did you begin in terms of research? I cast a wide net, and first I started researching. It was sort of the easier part of the research was just to look up women of the time who were active in the Communist Party. I say easier just because there are books that I could go find, although, mm, you Easy know. Easy is still a relative term. Yeah, when you're talking about the history of women, like, it, there's just not as much that got written down. But it turned out that, so my next door neighbors, like, in my apartment building are history professors at Rutgers, specializing oh in Holocaust studies and in communism in this time period. Well, that's fortuitous. <laughs> so I was like, hey, can you point me towards any any materials, and they just lent me some books they had sitting in their study. Which oh, was fabulous. The Jews in Germany were very, very assimilated. They were, they considered themselves German first. Yep. Sort of like American Jews, right? It's like we, we're Americans and we also are Jewish, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I even think in a, in a dissimilar way, though, sometimes of like, not only is there a lot of variety in American Jews, but I feel like what we've seen lately in about some of the European Jews of that time was really like an adoption of German traditions ahead of Jewish traditions. I think that's true. I mean, there were these women who worked in the Communist Party, the KPD, the Communist Party of Deutschland <laughs> or something. But they, I read actually only like 7% of the leaders of the party were women. There was a lot of sexism within the Communist Party hmm. in Germany. Uh, however, there were in two women who did briefly leaf, lead the party. The women were sort of given the grunt work of like flyering door to door, doing sort of just the tasks that the, the men, yeah, the menial labor that, that the men didn't really want to do. And they generally didn't get to stand on the soapbox and, and give the speech. But I do in Harmony. So I just thought, okay, what's the kind of woman who is drawn to that kind of environment? Mm -hmm. um, so that was one sort of aspect of the research. And then I was reading the New York Times review from 
the off-Broadway production of Harmony mm-hmm. and looking at the comments. I like love to look at the comments of New York Times articles. And I see this comment that says from, from a woman named Baron, no last name. And it just says, my mother is represented in the show in the character of Ruth. And I hope I get to see it in the future. And I wish this show lots of luck. Like she hadn't seen it. She lived on the West Coast, but she just decided to comment, you know, on the article or Mm -hmm. on the review. So I just, I'm like a spy, like a CIA spy. And so I just started typing her name in with, you know, various sort of keywords. So I wrote to her, I was like, you know, I'm playing this character that is partially based on your mother. And, you know, I would love to talk to you if you have any free time. She writes back to me like in a matter of hours. We just had this email exchange back and forth where I asked her all about her mom. And her mom didn't tell her a lot about, you know, her marriage to Irwin Boats. Actually, I don't think she told her really anything, Mm -hmm. which as an actor was also, to me, very useful in a weird way where you go, wow, this is a woman who she shut the door on her past. It was that painful that she she refused to talk mm. about it. That's useful as an actor. Right. And then, you know, there were other things that she told me about her mom. Like she said she could be very imperious, mm. not always a good quality. And that particular comment about her mom, I said, that's playable as an actor. I can be imperious and always believe I'm right. And uh, then she told me, you know, her mom became a hat designer. Yes. And so I, I I got a couple of her hats off of like Etsy. And, you know, I found some of her hats from the 1960s and ordered them. They're in my dressing room. Oh, that's Etsy. so cool. And they're really great. She was really talented. But of course, with Ruth being, Ruth is specifically not named yeah. Ursula. Ruth is not Ursula. But it's so fascinating that you were able to incorporate pieces of her so that we do have some pieces of just the the same way that Blake has pieces yeah. of Erwin Boats in him, you have pieces of the woman he was married to. And it's kind of freeing in a way where I can take pe- bits and pieces of all of these different women from history. Baron sent me some photos of her mom. And so I sent them to the wig designer. I sent them to the costume designer. We were able to reference them. They weren't going directly off of those, but we right. were, she was able to say, well, I thought in the your wedding dress should have a high neck, you know, so that it's modest. And I said, well, here was her wedding dress and it had a low neckline. (laughs) But the character of Ruth is also so critical in Harmony because not only is she providing this perspective of being married to a member of this vocal group, one that is counter to Mary and Rabbi, so that you can see the idea of two different experiences. She is also the through line of the state of Berlin, the state of Germany, the rise of the Third Reich that we really track through her and how alarmed she is as a member of the Communist Party. It's amazing to consider the number of lives the comedian harmonists closely touched. The proximity of these women to these six singers no doubt impacted their paths. Descendants are few, and those who are around can be difficult to track down. And yet, those who are here remain dedicated to keeping the memory of the comedian harmonists and their families alive. One of the lessons for me is we think long after the fact of all of the questions we wish we had asked of our parents and grandparents and their friends and uh, you know, if we had been a little more sophisticated and knowledgeable about their past, we would have definitely asked more questions. Who Were the Comedian Harmonists? The True Story Behind Broadway's Harmony is produced by Harmony, a new musical, and Broadway News, the home for digital journalism on Broadway. I'm your host, Ruthie Fearberg. Thank you so much for listening. To read more about The Comedian Harmonists, visit thecomedianharmonists.com. For more information about the musical Harmony, visit harmonyanewmusical.com. And of course, to learn more about all of the happenings on Broadway, visit broadwaynews.com. If you're fascinated by what you've heard so far on this podcast, please share The Comedian Harmonists' story on social media, 
and tag at Harmony, a new musical and at Broadway News. 